Well, good morning, church. It is so good to be with you today. And uh, today we're going to wrap up this series on Rabbi Jesus. And what I want to do today is to take all the things we've learned about Rabbi Jesus and apply them uh, to the teaching uh, of Rabbi Jesus. One teaching uh, in particular, and of all the great teachings that we have from Rabbi Jesus, perhaps uh, the greatest teaching is his sermon on on the mount. And so uh, before we dive in and start reading it, I want us to pray together. Would you just pray with me? In fact, just lay your hands open in your lap as if you're going to receive something from heaven. Uh, Father, today uh, we declare that we love you and we need you. And we pray today uh, that you would make the uh, word of God come alive in our lives. And our goal is to be with Rabbi Jesus, be taught by Rabbi Jesus, and, and be like Rabbi Jesus. And Holy Holy Spirit, we know that apart from you filling us and leading us, we're completely incompetent to do any of those things. So today we surrender to you, Holy Spirit, asking you to have your way in this place. Would you fill us and lead us? Anoint uh, the teaching of the word and the hearing of the word, but more than anything, would you change our lives? It's in Jesus' name we pray, and together uh, we all say amen and amen. Let's pick up in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, and let's read this together. It says, one day uh, Jesus saw the crowds gathering. So he went up on the mountainside and and he sat down. He he sat down. Now remember, we've talked about this. This is the posture of a rabbi. Uh, Matthew is telling us something here, that behind all the reporting of this sermon is the rabbi. And and when you start to look at the background of scripture, like we have in this series, you you begin to see these things and it makes it like a treasure hunt in in the scripture. Look at what uh, he, he goes on to say, his disciples uh, gathered around him. Now, th- this is exactly what we've been talking about. Jesus and the disciples, he's seated uh, on a stool. They're seated on the ground at his feet, and they're gathered around him. The posture of a rabbi, the posture of the disciples uh, of a rabbi. Just like we talked about Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus in Luke 10. Here, uh, the disciples are gathered around uh, Rabbi Jesus. And and notice that that he's on a mountain. Now, for the Jews, uh, a mountain reminds them of a primary story in their history, the story of Moses. Moses is the prototype uh, of rabbis, right? And Moses is almost always connected to a mountain. He went up the mountain, to hear from God, to receive the commandments from God. He came down the mountain to teach uh, the people. So Jesus is not only doing his rabbinic duty here, teaching them, he is showing them that he is greater uh, than Moses. And and now we we could go through the whole Sermon on the Mount. We could do what we've just done and look at it through a rabbinic uh, lens. We could dissect each verse, pull it all out and, and look at the background. But instead, I want us to look at one particular part of this sermon over in Matthew chapter uh, 6. Turn the page uh, to Matthew 6 because it's there uh, that something interesting begins to transpire. We start to see the language of the Bible begin to reveal uh, the God of the Bible in the person of Jesus. And and you and I use language every single day that, that we understand. But someone who doesn't speak the language, when they hear us, they're just kind of scratching their heads. Here's an example of what I mean. If I were to say to you, someone tailgated me on the way to church uh, this morning, you would know exactly what I meant. But if you weren't born here and you don't know the language, uh, that would be a head scratcher for you, right? Were you in a field? Was there an animal with a tail? Was there a cow trying to get through a gate? Uh, No, we, we call it tailgating because of what a tailgate is, right? A tailgate is, is on the back of your pickup truck to keep everything inside. It's at the tail end of your truck, but it's not really a, a gate, right? A gate opens sideways. Uh, a tailgate opens down. Unless you had, uh, like we did, the 1980 Custom Classic Cruiser, Oldsmobile station wagon. The, the back end of that would open like a gate, or you could roll the window down and it would open up like a, a tailgate on, on a pickup truck. But, but here's the crazy part you can tailgate a car. 
Doesn't even have a tailgate. You can be in a car tailgating another car and there'll be no tailgates around for miles and miles. But, but let's just say I was able to explain all of that to you. You got it and you understand it. Then next week I come up to you and say, hey, uh, this coming weekend is the big game. We're gonna get there an hour early to tailgate. You, you wouldn't know what to do, right? Uh, why are we showing up early to sit in traffic behind one another? Uh, tail and gate. Two words. They mean different things, but you put them together, it means something else. And you put them in a different context, and they mean something completely different. And if you don't know the language, it's hard to understand. So, so let's turn over to Matthew 6, because uh, the Bible does what I'm talking about sometimes. It sometimes says something that makes us scratch our heads, not because God is purposely being confusing, but because he was speaking into a culture that understood him. But, but we are a different culture, so we have to uh, dig. So, so let's go to Matthew chapter 6 and, and verse uh, 22, and look at what he says. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, circle that word in your Bible, uh, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, circle that word, uh, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. Okay, so why is Rabbi Jesus turning into optometrist Jesus here? Well, why is he talking about eyesight in this passage? In the middle of explaining spiritual disciplines, why does Jesus want us to think about our eyes? Great questions. Let's answer them. And I've done some digging this week, and I've learned some things about the eyes. And now I'm going to share that with you today. But first of all, this word for unhealthy is the Greek word poneros, which means evil. It doesn't just mean unhealthy. It means evil. Uh, in other words, Jesus is talking about the evil eye. Anyone ever heard of, of the evil eye? To, what it means to give somebody the evil eye? It's a big deal in the Middle East. The whole idea is that you could harm somebody by looking at them uh, with jealousy. Paul, Paul talks about this in Galatians, uh, actually, in chapter 3, verse 1. He says, who has bewitched you? Who's cursed you? Who's cast a spell on you? Uh, literally, who has given you the evil eyes? Literally what it says. You, you can give someone the evil eye to curse them. You can give someone the evil eye when you are jealous of them. But, but the evil eye is not just some sort of spell that you cast like you're Harry Potter. It, it's more uh, than that. The evil eye is about how you see others and what effect that has on you and uh, them. So, so now we have to start stringing the pearls like we talked about last week. We take the words for evil and I in, in the Hebrew, and, and we start searching, and we find some answers in, in the Old Testament. In fact, look at this in Proverbs uh, chapter 28. Greedy people, that word greedy, by the way, uh, we translate it in, in English uh, to greedy. It, it literally in the Hebrew is uh, evil eye. Ein is I, A-Y-I-N, Ra is evil, evil eye. So, so people with the evil eye, we translate it to greedy, uh, try to get rich quick, but don't realize they're headed for uh, poverty. So, so to have an evil eye means you're greedy. Well, what else? Well, let's go to uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, take care lest your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother and give him nothing. Uh, so it's not just that you're greedy, but it's also affecting how you see other people. So, so now let's go to the New Testament, one of Rabbi Jesus' disciples, John, and, and he says this about having the right kind of eye over in 1 John chapter 3, but, but if anyone has the world's uh, goods and sees, right, with his eye, sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So you see with your eye, but you don't do anything about it. That's what it means to have the, the evil eye. That's an evil eye, but, but there's another type of eye in Scripture. You keep looking and you're searching, and, and you find this. Go, go back to uh, Proverbs. And it says, blessed are those who are 
generous. Now watch this, because this word in the Hebrew is actually the word that means bountiful eye. The ones who have a bountiful eye uh, uh, feed the poor is what the scripture says. And so uh, literally the Hebrew there is ein eye, we talked about it, tov, which means good. The way you say good morning in Hebrew is you say boker tov, good morning. Uh, and Jesus is using this phrase, uh, ein tov, the good eye, uh, back in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew six twenty two. Remember, he says, if your eyes uh, are healthy, the Greek word there is haplos, which doesn't mean healthy per se, it means single or, or whole. So you have a single eye or a whole eye, a uh, healthy eye. But, but in Paul, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, a word just like it is translated as generous. In other words, the point is this, when your eye is healthy, you are generous. A, a, an evil eye is stingy. A good eye is generous. Now, why on all of this, what does it matter, right? Well, let's go back to Rabbi Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6 and uh, verse 22. Your eye is like a lamp, underline that, that provides light for your body. Now, an eye is not a lamp, right? At least not in our uh, culture. When you and I think of eyes in our culture, we think of the biology of the eye, that, that the eye is shaped like this, the light comes in, it's focused on a nerve back here so that our brain uh, can process uh, that image. Now, somebody with a degree in optometry can correct me on this, but I think I haven't dove in so far that I'm wrong. But, but I know that light goes into our eyes, right? That's how uh, we see. But with Jesus, in a Hebrew culture, it was actually backward. There, there was a theology uh, of uh, the eyes. Light doesn't just come into your eye. It actually comes out uh, of your eye also. You, you know how we say this, that their eyes lit up? This is from that Hebrew uh, phrase. It comes from the idea that your eyes can produce light. And so in a Hebrew mindset, there's a direct connection between your eyes and your heart. I, I don't know if you've read anything about this fairly new study called iridology, where they study the iris. Supposedly, they can map out all of your body's health by looking in your eye, by looking into your iris. But, but whatever is in your heart will come out of you through your eyes. That's what the way the Hebrews think. So if you have lust in your heart, you will look at pornography. If you have insecurity in your heart, you look to get hurt every day, right? If you have pride in your heart, you only look out for yourself. Your, your heart, uh, where your heart is, your eyes will go. And where your eyes go, your heart will follow. There is a relationship. In fact, there was a rabbi in the days of Jesus named Rabbi Yohanan ben Zaki. He lived during the same time as Jesus. And one day it's recorded that he asked his disciples, what's the best path to take in life? And one of them said, well, uh, have a good eye, ein tov. Another said, be a good friend. Uh, another disciple said, well, be a good neighbor. And the fourth one said, be wise about the future. And finally, one of them said, have a good heart. And Rabbi Yohanan said, that's it. That's the best path to take because it includes all of the others. In the Hebrew mindset, if you have a good heart, you'll have a good eye. You'll be a good friend. You, you will be a good neighbor. Your hands will do uh, good things. And, and what we need is some hand-eye coordination. And I'm not talking about perfecting your golf swing or, or playing pickleball. I, I, I'm talking about your hand and your eye lining up, your hands and your eyes lining up. F first, work on a good heart, and that will affect your eyes. And, and ultimately, it will affect your hands. What? What, what does all this mean? Well, let's go back and find the context that Rabbi Jesus dropped all of this dialogue about good eyes and bad eyes uh, into, because right before Jesus talks about eyes, he tells a story, okay? So back up just a couple of verses to verse 19. And look at what he says. Don't store up treasures here on earth. He didn't say don't save. He's saying don't hoard, right? The, the difference between hoarding and saving is a matter of the heart. Jesus is not prohibiting things, but the love of things. He's not prohibiting money, but the love of money. Now look at what he says. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moss eat them, rust destroys them, and thieves break in and steal them. When we hoard what we have, 
And by the way, what we have is what is given to us by God. And according to the scripture, when we hoard what God gives us, we lose it. Remember, uh, rabbis prefer pictures over words, right? And, and the first picture here is moths uh, will, will eat it or, or destroy it. In, in those days, clothing was incredibly expensive, and it could be a form of investment, right, to have nice clothes. So it would horrify them for a moth to destroy their clothes. The, the, the next picture is the rust eats it. And finally, the third picture is thieves uh, break in and steal, uh, literally break through the walls of a home made of dried mud. But, but I want you to think uh, about this last thing, this last thing uh, that he says, thieves. Now, let's string the pearls like we talked about last week. Who do we know that's a thief? Uh, who's the one who comes only to kill, steal, and, and, and destroy? The enemy. The, the devil, right? And he wants nothing more than to steal from you. And he's figured out that if he can get you stingy, get you worried, get you scared, that, that you will hoard what you have and you will not share it. And, and you, will, you will be robbing from yourself because he knows that a lack of generosity can cut the gospel off. Pa Paul told Timothy in, in chapter six uh, that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Do, do you know the best cure for the love of yourself, for the love of money, it's generosity. It's to give it uh, away. People who are free with their money are free from their money. And they find ways to love others with their money. A instead of hoarding your money, you, you, you do this. Look at what he says. Store your treasure in heaven where moss and rust cannot destroy and thieves uh, do not break in and steal. But how do you do that? And what does that even mean, right? Uh, we, we don't have a way uh, to transfer money into heaven, do we? Uh, like some offshore account that we can't get our hands on. What does that even mean? See, the idea of storing up treasure in heaven was well known for uh, the Hebrews. The point is you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. Now, remember, our mission as a church is to help people advance in their journey with Jesus Christ, all parts of your journey with Jesus Christ. And, and that includes giving, right? Uh, we, we've taught this before. There are five levels of biblical uh, giving. Let me remind you uh, of, of what those are. The, the first level is what we call the initial giver. This is when a person decides to give for the first time as a response to God's word about giving. In fact, this year uh, at Battle Creek Church, since January 1, we've had 561 people take this initial step. C can we just celebrate those who have taken that step in, in their faith journey? A and maybe you're here today, you're visiting, or maybe you've been attending for a while, but you've never taken that step. Can I challenge you to take that step today? And maybe you have taken that step. Well, there's another one. The, ne the next step is called the consistent giver. The consistent giver decides to give consistently. As a disciple of Jesus, this is the person who says, I'm going to do this every week or every other week or every month, depending on how income flows into uh, my life. This is the person who goes on the app or the website and sets up a recurring uh, gift. They say, I'm going to do this whether I'm there or not. I'm going to do this whether the service was any good or not. I'm going to do this consistently. The, the next step is what we call the priority giver. The, the priority giver understands the preeminence of Christ and since he is above all things, he deserves our best. Meaning a priority giver is someone who gives in relationship to everything else they do with finances and financial priorities, reflecting God first in this whole list of priorities in their lives, giving to the degree uh, that uh, an adjustment is required. In other words, I'm going to give this and place this in the kingdom. But if I do that, if we do this, if we give that, some other things are going to have to be altered. They're going to have to change. Here's the next giver, uh, giver is the surrendered giver. The surrendered giver recognizes the power of the gospel and has the goal of using 100% of their resources to that end. They're gospel-centered, right? A surrendered giver gives in a way that changes them. They're not just asking, what am I going to give? They're going to ask, what am I not giving and why? 
Why, why would I not? God, all of this is yours. And they ask him the question on a regular basis. How do I honor you with, with this? How do I honor you with everything you've put in, in my hands? And, and then one last level we call the eternal uh, giver. The, the eternal giver makes decisions in the short term that have long-term eternal effects. What home they buy, whether they get that car, how they save, how they invest, the sale of a property or, or a business, all of their long-term goals include their giving goals. That Their giving is focused on eternity, right? And, and so here's the question, where are you on this chart? Let, let the Holy Spirit tell you and, and ask him if he would help you advance in your journey with him. Hey, hear me today, church. Listen, death will either, either move you closer to or farther from your treasure. It depends on where you start. Store it, right? And, and what's great is what this whole idea uh, represents is that if you have treasure, you want to keep it safe, right? And he heaven lies beyond the reach of the enemy. That's good news, right? You will be storing up treasure that cannot be stolen from your enemy. And, and again, just like Rabbi Yohanan said, it's about a good heart. So, so let's bring this whole thing, Jesus teaching, full circle, and, and watch this that your hands are actually affected by your eyes. And your eyes are affected by your heart. And your heart is affected by your treasure. And this whole thing goes full circle, right? That what we, we, what we do is we take our treasure with our hands and put it in the things of God. This is what Rabbi Jesus is getting at when he says, wherever your treasure is, the desires of your heart will also be or will be also, right? So our eyes reveal our heart, but our heart is directed by, influenced by, our treasure, right? And so what kind of giver is it that, that, that God loves? Does he love a big giver? Sure, he loves a big giver. Does he love a consistent giver? Sure, but, but that's really not what the scripture says. What the scripture says is God loves a cheerful giver. That's 2 Corinthians 9, by the way. It would be a great uh, passage for you to read this week. And by the way, to be a cheerful giver is to be thankful for what you have. In other words, gratitude will unlock generosity in your life. That's why in this season, we're beginning the daily habits with a moment of gratitude. What am I thankful for today? And by the way, that word cheerful means happy to do so. Meaning what? Meaning your heart is in it, right? And what do we know about the heart? Our heart follows our treasure. And listen, Jesus is not nearly as interested in our treasure as he is in our hearts. And he knows the prescription to get your heart is through this monopoly money that you and I are playing around with in this life that's here today and gone tomorrow. When you're interested in the kingdom, look, you're interested in the king. And Rabbi Jesus' disciples understood that. You remember when he, he left and they started that very first church in, in Acts 2. This is how they lived. In fact, let's look at that. Acts 2, 44. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those among them in need. In other words, they practiced this radical form of generosity that we rarely see today. That, that's the key to a radical generosity is a glad heart. They were willing to see with their eyes what they owned, what they worked for, what they put their own stamp on, what they called their own through God's eyes. L listen, here's the point. Generosity was at the very center of Rabbi Jesus' message. He, he taught his disciples constantly about money. In fact, in Luke 12, we've been in Luke all throughout this series, who coincidentally wrote Acts as well. But in Luke 12, uh, we, we uh, read that he says, when someone has been given much, and by the way, is the Bible an American book or a global book? It's a global book. And so understanding who's been given much relatively is something we have to compare to the whole globe. So all of us, even the least fortunate among those of us in America have been given much, right? So when someone's been given much, much will be required in return. That means we, we give back. In other words, if you've received, then you give. As the light comes into the eye, the light goes 
out of the eyes, right? And, and if you've got something from God, you give back to uh, God. And listen, Jesus wasn't trying to guilt his followers into giving more. He was showing them how to be grateful through gratitude. And, and, and generosity is when we bring our idea of giving closer to God's idea of giving. And, and let me just explain to you how that works. The, the first thing you need to understand is that you can't outgive God. Uh, that's one of our values as a church, by the way. In other words, there's no amount of money, no amount of possession that you and I could give that would ever come close to the amount God has given us. There is no possible way, even if we gave every moment of every day, every cent we ever made for the rest of our lives, we, we can never outgive God. In fact, the most famous scripture in all of the Bible that talks about this is in John uh, 3.16. And it says, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. He, he gave more than any of us would be willing to give. He gave his own son. And, and you can try to outgive God. I, I love the challenge. But, but when it comes to this, I, I think we're safe in saying we would all fail to meet that standard. We can't outgive God because he gave so much when he gave us his son. But remember, the way of the rabbi, as, we, as we've talked about in this series, was to be with the rabbi, taught by the rabbi, and like the rabbi. And, and your rabbi and mine gave his life for us. When we are with the rabbi, we experience his generosity. When we're taught by the rabbi, we learn to show his generosity. And when we are like our rabbi, we practice his generosity and put his kingdom above our own. That's why Rabbi Jesus finishes this whole discussion, this whole sermon in Matthew 6 by telling us this, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. Church, here's what I want you to hear today. Generosity, it doesn't just fund the mission. It is the mission. What Would you pray with me across all of our campuses today? Uh, Father, we thank you for teaching us today. Holy Spirit, we thank you for answering our prayer and, and uh, anointing the hearing of the Word of God and applying it to our hearts and our lives. And today, uh, I pray that we would just ask you where we are on this growth chart and where you want to take us. Which direction are we headed? We, we may be at one level, but going the wrong direction. Father, help, help us to be on one level, moving the right direction to the next level and the next level that we would learn to be like our rabbi. And Father, by doing that in us and by doing that through us, would you impact not just this church, but this city, and not just this city, but this state and nation and world for your own glory and the good uh, uh, of the people. In Jesus' name we pray, and together we all say amen and amen.